Hello there and welcome back to the Chaps Guide. My name is Ash and I am your host on this journey through men's style, self-development and personal grooming. And today I'm answering some of the many questions that are posed to me on this channel. And um, you can send me your questions either by leaving them in the comments section below, or if you go to the main YouTube page at the About tab, you will find my email address. Please feel free to drop me any question you like. But one disclaimer, all right? I am not an expert. I am an ordinary gentleman of 52 years of age who has been on a sartorial and life journey, and I am happy to provide my observations and personal thoughts, but remember, this is not expert testimony. It is merely my opinion. So you must take it as it's intended with the finest of intentions. So today, let us begin. Let us answer some of the questions that have been sent to me. And I have to say, it's always a pleasure to receive a question. And today, my first question is from Iradia Kalens, who says to me, Hello, I'd like to ask, do you think it's appropriate to wear a military-issued greatcoat without any insignia? I bought it secondhand. It's a beautiful, heavy, warm overcoat. Um, I've been thinking lately, maybe it's wrong to wear it because I've never served in the military. And of course, that's an excellent question. And because many people are unsure of the protocols around wearing former military kit uniform uh, in a sort of civilian environment, particularly if you've never been in the military, because you're worried about accusations perhaps of stolen valour or trying to pass yourself off as a serving member or a veteran member of the forces. But in this case, I wouldn't have any qualms at all, because there's a long history of military surplus kit being worn by people in civilian application. I mean, you know, when I was growing up, there were army and navy stores in the UK where you could buy surplus military equipment, which would be great for going in the outdoors and dressing up in camouflage if you like fishing or whatever. And the overcoats, which were in the military, great coats as they were called, are a, a splendid item in the winter because they're very thick, very warm, they're designed for that purpose. So as long as you're not wearing any insignia on there, which may suggest an affiliation with a military unit, I think you're absolutely fine. Great coats can be wonderful garments, but just steer clear of any insignia and you're laughing. Okay, so my second question is from Mark. Good afternoon, Ash. I hope you are well. Indeed, I am, sir. Same to you. I have a question regarding moisturizers, moisturizers and aftershave balms, and it's quite simple. Is there a difference? I shave every other day, and therefore, at the moment, alternate between a moisturizer and an, aftersha and an aftershave balm. Uh, but as my tube of Taylor of Old Bond Street um, balm is coming to an end, do I need to buy another? Okay. I understand what you're saying. Um, you like to apply an aftershave balm after you've had a shave, but what you're saying really is, is it okay to use that as a general moisturizer? Perhaps the way I would answer is by telling you about my own regime, because I moisturize my skin twice a day, all right? First time in the morning, I will have a shave and I will apply a moisturizer, but I'll focus upon the areas that I've shaved, but I will also apply it to the entirety of my face. I use a witch hazel first of all, and then I use a moisturizing balm. Now, I apply that balm all over my face. That's after a shave. In the evening, when I've had a shower, when my skin is nice and open, the pores are open and ready to receive another dose of moisturizer, after that shower, I will apply just a, a general moisturizer. I don't use anything specific. I wouldn't suggest, as other YouTubers do, to um, you know, use any particular type of moisturizer because everybody's skin chemistry is different. Your skin will react differently to mine, to a moisturizer. But in the evening, I use a more general moisturizer. You know, um, something, I use cheap stuff, to be honest. I use L'Oreal stuff, they're for men range. And I find that very hydrating for the skin and I use it all over my face. So in the morning, I use an aftershave balm as a moisturizer. In the evening, I just use a normal moisturizer 
throughout the whole facial area. So I hope that answers your question. I'm not too precious about it because I have been on a journey and I know which moisturizers work best for my skin. You will find the same as you go on a journey. It's not necessarily necessary, too many necessaries there, to use uh, a specific moisturizer and an aftershave balm if you only want to invest in one. You know, and you're only going to moisturize your skin once a day. Let that sink in. Okay, next question. The Hooch Man asks me, Ash, simple question. Why is it a faux pas to wear a dive watch? I worked for a consumer electronics lifestyle company and we would have multiple formal events during the year. At those events, I would see wet men wearing blingy, iced out watches or highly fashionable watches like Hublot, Gucci and Hermes uh, with a black suit, uh, a white shirt and tie, black tie. Granted, these were opera events, but why do some YouTubers consider wearing a chunky wristwatch a fashion faux pas? I get where you're coming from. Um, and I understand it entirely because those people who are deeply invested in a classic men's stylish look will say that the only wristwatch which is acceptable is a dress watch. And typically that'll be a precious metal watch worn with a dark leather band, the classic. And we'll, we could have in our minds watches like uh, the Cartier Tank American, or maybe the, um, Gigi Lacoute Reverso. These watches are what I conjure up in my mind as the classic dress watch. However, times have changed. You know, the world has changed. In a video I did recently about, I think it was um, five reasons to wear a tie, in that video where I was fairly well dressed, I was wearing a, a dive watch, a Rolex Submariner. And I had a couple of comments actually on that video which said your, your look was ruined by the fact you were wearing a clumsy looking dive watch. I would suggest that mindset is somewhat outdated because, I mean, I'm wearing a, um, a GMT Master watch today, which again has that clunky, large stainless steel looking wristwatch look. The world has changed. I mean, and it started, um, I hate to say it, with a fictional character called James Bond, who in the 1950s, well, 1960s, when Bond appeared on screen, from the very beginning, he started, he was seen wearing larger sports watches. And you'll see the early Sean Connery iteration of James Bond sporting a Rolex Submariner. And you'll see all of the subsequent Bonds right up to Daniel Craig wearing the Submariner when Pierce Brosnan, uh, sorry, Pierce Brosnan was where they came in, started wearing Omega wristwatches, the Seamaster, again, large dive watches. And this has become something of an acceptable thing now within society. If you are so classically inclined in mind that you won't wear anything other than a pure dress watch, that's fair enough, I agree with you. It is the sleekest, best looking watch for the most formal attire. In fact, there is a train of thought which suggests that a gentleman in a black tie should wear no wristwatch because it is an unnecessary accoutrement within your outfit. Because why does a man attending a black tie event need to check the time? He is there purely for pleasure, doesn't need to know the, the time. In fact, it could be rude to your host to be seen looking at your watch, which suggests you've got somewhere more important to be. So when it comes to um, wearing chunky watches, dive watches, or wearing dress watches, I would suggest we've, we're at a point in time where it is down to personal taste. You will frequently see me wearing dive watches. I often wear a Submariner uh, or something of that nature. Um, I very, very, very rarely would ever wear a dress watch at this point in my life because I have very few watches with leather straps. Personal taste. Choose what you like, wear it with pride and passion and you won't go wrong. Okay. Next question. Uh, and this is from, um, let's have a look, somebody called Tim. It is from Tim. And Tim says, I have found your guide quite recently and subscribed to your channel. Well done, sir. Um, I love your content. I'm gradually working my way through your videos. Well, good luck. There's about 270 there now, so it'll take you a while, but it'll be an enjoyable journey. Um, a quick question. What is your take on leather jackets? I don't mean the type with studs uh, and a skull and crossbones on the back. I mean something like a Bellstaff Panther. Are these acceptable in normal situations? 
I would say, sir, of course they are. Everything is acceptable in normal situations in the modern era. And when you're talking about a classic heritage British brand like Bellstaff, um, I think it's hard to go wrong because they hit that wonderful combination of looks of being rugged, sporty, yet still having that heritage leaning speak so that they are acceptable uh, in in city environments. Um, they have a, a, a range these days called the Trailmaster, which I think is glorious. It is absolutely wonderful. It's got a bit of a retro look, so it's got a throwback to a bygone era, but it is still tough and rugged enough for any situation. Um, when it comes to the leather jacket, it has tailed off in recent years. Yes, leather has sort of slipped away when it comes to um, many gentlemen's outer clothing. Um, for me, things like Bellstaff, the reason I don't own any is because they're ferociously expensive. I'd love to have one, but you know, they're upwards of £800 and for me, that is rather a lot of money just for one jacket. Um, so it's a limiting factor for many people, but I think if you like them, they look sharp, they look trim, um, they've got that throwback to, you know, Indiana Jones wearing his leather jacket, rugged, tough, sporty, outdoorsy. Wear it, again, with pride and passion. Cut a dash in your world. Okay, next question. I've got quite a few questions here. This may be the last one, actually. Let me just check. Oh no, one more after that. Uh, this is a question from Philip, Philip Clink. Dear Ash, I enjoyed your series at Oak Lodge. I'm a tie wearer and love the opportunity to stamp my style on an ensemble, as do I. As an ex-military man, I know you would be well qualified when handling an iron. Indeed I am. Um, I have a question. Knowing your love of chinos, do you iron them flat or steam a crease into them? Could you point me in the right direction? Thank you, Phil from Sydney. Well, um, Thank you, Phil, for your question. Sydney, a city I have not been to, to for a while. I spent three weeks in Sydney quite a long time ago and I had a spectacular period of time there. One of my favorite countries, Australia, also accounting for the fact that all of the wildlife seeks to kill you. But other than that, I loved it. And your question is a good one um, because one of my bugbears when it comes to men's style is men do not iron their trousers enough, all right? But there's a distinction. When it comes to chinos, I iron my chinos flat. Unless they come from the manufacturer with a crease already in them, to my mind, that means they are designed to be ironed flat. And when it comes to a chino, there are very, very few which um, have a crease down the front. Uh, and I like iron them accordingly. There's nothing wrong with that, all right? The trouser, it's a utility garment. It will uh, fit you much better, it'll be much more comfortable, and it'll look better over several days if you don't have the crease in the front. However, when it comes to other trousers, slacks of another nature, you know, um, flannel slacks, uh, other types of suit garments, you know, other, whatever, you, whatever trousers, if they come with a crease in them when you buy them, that means it is up to you to maintain that crease. Get the iron out, right? Get yourself a simple ironing cloth, just a piece of cotton cloth. You know, if you've got an old shirt, before you throw that shirt away, cut the back out of that shirt, there you've got a perfect ironing cloth. Lay that cloth over your trousers and steam that crease into them every so often. Not every day, every other day, every, every so many days. Keep that crease sharp. There is nothing which delineates between the well-dressed man and the man who pays no heed to his attire than that crease. It says a lot about you. So get that crease in there, but if it's chinos, you don't have to. That's one of the beauties of wearing a pair of chinos. They require less maintenance. So there we go. Hope that answers your question, Phil. And there we go, one more from Andrew. I've just watched your latest channel. I'm a long-time subscriber. Thank you, sir. Um, can I ask if you have an opinion on pinky rings? Um, my father is the only uh, one to have a son in his family. My two aunties have children who have different surnames to me. I don't have children myself, so my family's surname will end with me. I am considering buying a bespoke pinky ring. My oldest nephew will inherit it from my estate and hopefully keep my surname alive. 
I have found my family crest and a jeweller has quoted £700. I am retired and part of me thinks that gold isn't a bad investment. What do you think? Well, Andrew, I don't wear rings myself, all right? It's a personal preference. I don't even wear a wedding ring, despite having been married for 15 years in two days time, wedding anniversary coming up. My personal preference. However, I think the pinky ring definitely has a place in the stylish man's outfit. I know this because Prince Charles, the Prince of Wales, one of the most stylishly, classically dressed men in the world, is often to be seen sporting a pinky ring. And I think having one with a crest is a great idea. Uh, having one commissioned as well for £700 sounds reasonable, not too bad. Another way that you can personalise it is if you've got some family gold kicking around, maybe a wedding ring from your grandmother or something like that which is in your collection. Why not take that gold to the jewellers and get it to be recast as your pinky ring? That way there's this enduring con connection between the family and that ring on your finger. So what a great idea. So for me, I don't wear them, but I think there's definitely a place. As ever, when it comes to jewellery on a gentleman, my limit is one ring per hand. All right, so if you've got a wedding ring, that's enough for the left hand. If you have no ring on your right hand at all, pinky ring on the right hand, that would be it. When you start putting two rings on the same hand, and I would suggest if you have a pinky ring and a wedding ring right next to each other, you start to over egg the pudding. One ring per hand, Remember, less is more when it comes to men's style. It'll work out for you. Ah, and let's have a look. Final question, I think. Um, from Max, Max Crook. Good morning, Ash. I have a question for your next Q&A. My question is, would you consider wearing a pocket watch? Thanks for your question, Tim. Good one. Simple answer is no. For me, they would not fit into my lifestyle. Now, I know some men love a pocket watch. It's a throwback to a bygone era. It's an accessory which is rare. If you wear a waistcoat, it's an ideal item to have, uh, you know, to, to bring that throwback from a bygone era, slip it into the waistcoat pocket. You can have a chain attached to the, to the buttonhole. It can be part of your whole ensemble. But for me, I wear a wristwatch and a pocket watch, you know, it's, it's not something which sings out to me. I have bought one. I bought one for a friend many years ago as a gift because he wanted to wear a pocket watch with his ensemble of clothing. I don't know if he did in the end because he moved abroad, so I never kept up with whether he used that pocket watch. But simply for me, it wouldn't be something I could include into my wardrobe because it's a little bit too, and I'm going to use the word very advisedly here, bordering on the eccentric because in this day and age you know if you saw a gentleman drawing out his pocket watch to check the time it would stand out in a crowd and it's just a point which I wouldn't feel entirely comfortable with at this stage in my life so sorry it's not uh, in the positive because the question suggests that you would like a pocket watch but if you do rock it with pride and passion I've said it before pride and passion that is what your clothing should be all about. It should instill within you a pride in your appearance and a passion about the items that you're wearing. If you can't tick both of those boxes, you're dressing wrong. Change the way that you dress to make you feel those emotions of pride and passion. So there we go. Those are my questions for today. I hope they've brought some interest to you, that you have found them to be beneficial. If you have, of course, you can show me you like them by giving me a thumbs up. You can uh, click the subscribe button if you want to see more Q&A questions in the future. You can contribute to those Q&A questions by um, leaving me those questions in the comment section or via my email in the about section on the main YouTube page. And if you want to practically support the channel, you can click that super thanks button down by the thumbs up button, or you can even buy me a coffee and you'll find a link to our buy me a coffee page in the show notes below. So until the next time, take care of yourselves, continue to look good, and I will see you again very soon.